Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to our panel on education in intelligent communities. My name is Norm Jackness. I'm senior fellow at the Intelligent Community Forum, also on the faculty at Columbia University. I, um, uh, I think it's important for everybody to remember that one of the six pillars of intelligent communities that ICF has been talking about for years uh, is uh, education, uh, developing the workforce, uh, um, lifelong learning, if you will, um, and how that can be enhanced by the use of technology, but that's not the, all there is to it. Uh, we are uh, lucky today uh, to have uh, two of the uh, most prominent uh, academic leaders who think about these issues uh, with us. Um, and uh, you know, I'm going to welcome them uh, here. Uh, they are going to discuss uh, on our behalf where they think um, remote education is going, uh, what their own experiences have been, um, and, and how all this uh, fits in, how an intelligent community fits into the uh, future of of preparing everybody, students and, and people who don't call themselves students, uh, for the challenges that we're all going to be facing tomorrow. So uh, with that, our two speakers are uh, Dr. Kristen Wilcox of the University of Albany and Dr. David Staley of Ohio State University. Um, in order to sort of um, make the most use of our time, what I've asked them to do is to sort of weave in uh, their own uh, backgrounds, their academic careers, um, and, uh, and explain how it is that helped them to deal with the challenges of COVID, um, how they handle it, how their institutions handle it, and sort of what their anticipation is uh, in the coming semesters of how this is going to uh, play out, uh, both in terms of their own teaching responsibilities and those of their institutions. Um, so uh, with that, I think I'll start with uh, Dr. Wilcox. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, okay, so I uh, teach um, courses in the master's and doctoral program in educational policy and leadership at the University of Albany. I'm also a research and development director uh, for a research practice partnership called New York Kids. It's funded by the state of New York and it's supported by all the major organizations in the education sector um, that represent principals, teachers, uh, school superintendents. Um, so yeah, I mean, typically I teach courses in a hybrid format at the master's and doctoral level at our university. And like everyone else, we went into a more uh, remote uh, configuration. And so uh, for the last year, I really haven't stepped on my campus. Uh, so there's been a lot of distance from my colleagues and from my students. Um, and as for my research in uh, P-12 schools, uh, that was also heavily affected by the pandemic. Um, I had studies going on uh, doing interviews and focus groups uh, with young people in schools around New York State. I was not able to go into the schools during the pandemic, um, so that research had to completely stop. Um, and then I started a new study, uh, pivoted with a group of colleagues to look at educators' uh, responses to the pandemic over the last six months that so we're doing research there. Um, and I guess I would just conclude with that. Um, I also do improvement work directly with schools um, around New York State and that uh, direct involvement with schools was also almost completely stopped. Um, in the words of one of my partners at a school, they were in chaos in P12. And so the idea of trying to do continuous quality improvement in their schools, which is what I assist them with, was just off the radar. What's happening going forward? Uh, for, for you uh, and, your, and your institution? Yeah, so um, the University at Albany has been heading up a minority health disparities research group. And I've been connected with a group of colleagues um, through that, um, that effort. Uh, so in public health and social welfare. So we're trying to make connections across our sectors as we research coming out of this pandemic. Um, I'm currently working with some colleagues on looking at how leaders communicated uh, with their staff and also with their communities as the CDC guidelines changed consistently and, and it was really creating a, an environment of a lot of, um, of strain and stress. So I have a study going on right now. I'm going to continue to work with other colleagues across sectors to make sense out of those data and just think and forward thinking about how do we make more adaptable systems going forward. Um, will you be um, teaching online or um, you know hybrid or how's it how's it going to work? 
Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm fully online again in the fall. Um, I teach a continuous quality improvement course um, for education leaders, and I oftentimes have people in the human services take that course. So that will be a fully remote. Um, I usually try to include synchronous and asynchronous um, interactions in those courses. Um, I've also been asked to create some uh, smaller uh, kind of bite-sized courses in a micro-credential program um, so that people can more easily fit these kinds of courses into their lives. Uh, so that's what I have on the radar for the fall, and we'll see. Spring is still a little bit up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Staley, uh, and so uh, uh, you, you developed a career and never expected, I'm sure, to have to deal with COVID. So uh, how did it all go for you, and where's that, where are you going in the future? I think you're, uh, are you still muted? Ah. Uh. One minute. Where's um, uh, where's our friend uh, Matt Owen? You might want to try just unplugging your headset because we heard you fine before you had it plugged in. That. There we go. We hear you. There you go. <laughs> I don't know what my headset did, but uh... <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, Norm, you asked me uh, if I anticipated COVID, and it, uh, uh, I, I, I'd say maybe I sort of did. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, I, in 2018, I, uh, so I write a, uh, a futures column, a monthly futures column, and I asked the question, what if there were another global pandemic? But uh, I didn't imagine the, um, I, I, I didn't imagine the impact that COVID would have uh, just because, you know, we're the United States. Uh, and I thought that uh, our public health system and our political and uh, political system was such that we'd be able to handle it much better than we did. So I was maybe as surprised as, uh, as everyone else was. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your background though. Um, and... <clears throat> so uh, as, as, as you introduced me, I'm, uh, I'm on faculty at Ohio State. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the history department, uh, but I have appointments as well in the design department and in the department of educational studies. Uh, and in fact, I'll be teaching a class this fall, team teaching a class this fall in our uh, College of Public Affairs. So uh, I don't stay in my lane uh, very well. Uh, I've uh, also recently, recently been named a fellow of the uh, Center for uh, Science and the Imagination at Arizona State. Uh, and I'm a, an honorary faculty fellow at Bay Path University's Center for Higher Education Leadership and Innovative Practice. And I uh, point to those last two, not so much to burnish my credentials, but to point out that uh, I've never actually set foot in Tempe uh, or in, uh, um, uh, in uh, um, I can't remember even the, the name of the town in Massachusetts that Bay Path is located. Both of these uh, emerged as part of the COVID year, uh, uh, sort of remote uh, associations. And so I, I bring this up as a way to say that it wasn't just simply teaching, but uh, other sorts of professional activities, I think, uh, we learned to carry out, I guess, remotely. And I suspect that that's one of the things that we will see going forward. Do you expect to be teaching remotely in the fall again? Uh, I do not. Uh, and when I, uh, what I mean by that is uh, I plan to be back in the classroom, as, uh, in a face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, and that is the plan that the university is taking. And the only reason I hedge that is that last fall, I taught an asynchronous online course, but was already sort of scheduled to do that anyway. Um, for us, the biggest change was spring of 2020, having to quickly pivot, because we were right in the middle of a semester, quickly pivot to uh, online delivery. Uh, but this past spring, spring uh, 21, uh, I taught all my classes over Zoom. Interesting. But do not plan, not, uh, as, and as Kristen suggests, who knows, uh, but the plan <laughs> is to teach, uh, the plan is to teach uh, in person in the fall. Um, actually, I, I, I do, I'm curious to ask both of you just quickly uh, how you balance the advantages and disadvantages of the uh, remote learning uh, with uh, classroom learning. So if you can just respond to that based on your experience now that you're veterans of this COVID <laughs> world. <laughs> I'd like to hear from uh, Kristen's thoughts. Okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was really fortunate. Uh, the University at Albany uh, had uh, started providing a lot of support to faculty 
over a decade ago on how to engage in online teaching and learning. Um, some of my colleagues are leaders in, in um, the scholarship in that area. And so we benefited from a lot of their knowledge from their research about how to engage in online teaching and learning. Uh, so I, I guess I felt like, um, you know, the pandemic didn't change so much what I do in terms of our, my instructional practice. Um, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think um, one thing that's really on the radar right now is how we can engage our students using online technologies, but then also what we're doing on the front around systemic racism and decolonizing our curriculum at the higher education level. And that's another kind of pandemic um, that we're trying to adjust to now. And so um, I actually am missing a meeting with my colleagues right now, but that's okay, um, <laughs> where we are working together on decolonizing our syllabi at the university level. So there, there's a lot of things that we're, we're trying to do all at once. Dr. Staley. You know, um, similar, similar to the experience that Kristen had, uh, I think, um, but, but one of the things that I think became um, obvious, at least to me in teaching classes, is I think we made certain assumptions about the, uh, the, the technological access uh, that our students have. Uh, and so uh, when we made this, the, the switch mid-semester uh, in spring 20, uh, of course, we sent all of our students home. And for some of those students, uh, that meant in places like uh, uh, rural or uh, Appalachian, Ohio, and I know I had at least one student, and I, and I noticed in the chat, there have been discussions about rural broadband. And there was one student I remember in particular that had, that had real challenges, frankly, participating in the class. Uh, could not uh, ha have his video on, uh, his audio was, was, was intermittent and crackling. And I think that those, uh, those sorts of differences, I think, need to be addressed going forward. We've been using, I think uh, quite correctly, we've started using the term here, remote learning. Uh, and I know that that's meant to sort of parallel the idea of remote work. Uh, I'm not certain the degree to which students are not, not sort of intellectually or pedagogically ready for remote learning, but just in terms of their infrastructure, do they have the infrastructure to be able to participate uh, in remote learning? And I think that's still a question that is yet to be resolved. That's one of the things that ICF has been talking about for years. Thank you <laughs> for that affirmation. Um, actually, just I'll, I'll quickly, just my own, my own observation. Uh, I, I have a little different situation. I'm mostly teaching graduate students, and uh, by and large, uh, they've had decent technology. So you can sort of see the value once that's in place. Um, I sort of take what's called a flipped classroom approach, where the lecture is not during the class, but the class is much more interactive. What I found is that the remote learning was that actually uh, worked much better for that kind of approach. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, students, uh, particularly who were non-American students who were less likely to uh, talk up in a class situation were more likely to participate and feel a little bit more equal to everybody else uh, in online learning for what it's worth. So anyway, um, uh, Dr. Wilcox, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your work uh, uh, as the uh, development, uh, research and development director of NY Kids. Um, there's a discussion on the website uh, entitled Rural School Adaptations, Improvements, and Innovations, right? This is just to our point we're talking about right now, uh, where you go into how to improve student outcomes um, during COVID and actually after. Um, and uh, so could you share some of the information about that work here um, and, uh, uh, you know, what you would recommend as going forward? Yeah, well, that particular presentation was one school that we partner with. Um, I've uh, learned a lot from uh, colleagues at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching around um, partnerships, research practice partnerships in particular, and then also using improvement science as kind of a foundational core to the work um, of improving outcomes in, in P12. And so that particular um, uh, presentation, and I also have a case study written up on that, uh, was one rural school that was um, experiencing a lot of the same kinds of issues that David was just talking about with um, broadband um, access uh, being quite poor in some areas around New York State and um, the social isolation for those young people in those uh, communities on top of that they had um, very spotty internet connections. 
um, to engage in their in their classwork and that was their only access to learning was was really um, pretty devastating for some of those kids. So, um, you know, we're we're right now from the research angle, I'm I'm uh, I'm working on um, kind of pulling on a few different um, lines of inquiry. Uh, one of them around performance adaptation and. You know what we know from that research is that you know dynamic and complex uh, challenges require different kinds of structures in terms of how people collaborate with each other, um, where decision making is done, um, how leaders communicate that to frontline staff, and they all have reper repercussions that just flow all the way to children. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that's one of the angles that we're taking um, right now. And in terms of reconnecting with P12 um, school leaders, I'm working this summer on a number of um, presentations and just actually just not so much presentations, but facilitating discussions because, um, you know, people have experienced a, a, a great deal of stress in some places more than others. Um, so the research I'm doing right now, I'm trying to pull through to assist um, school leaders and district leaders, as well as those frontline educators on just, you know, how do they re-engage their staff? How do they um, create some positive anticipation um, for school again? And this just refocusing on social emotional well-being. Um, it's just not not just for the kids. I mean, the kids absolutely need that, um, but but the adults who work with them. They need to figure out how to reconnect with each other. And some of them have experienced this pandemic in um, really devastating ways. Uh, others have been able to weather it um, pretty well. Um, so, and and by urbanicity, um, as David was saying, and coming back to that, that issue around just the technological infrastructure that was available. And New York State's one of the better states in the country in terms of that, but we still had pockets of um, children who were really um, missing opportunities for learning over an entire year, which is which is pretty severe. Interesting. Okay. Um, all right, um, Dr. Staley, uh, I'm going to ask you. You've uh, you've actually written a book two years ago uh, about reimagining universities for the future. A uh, very interesting book, and um, and you've had an interview fairly recently um, uh, that I read. Three questions about COVID-19 and the future. Uh, where you explore the idea of, uh, of short-term and long-term changes in education because of COVID um, and presumably what we have learned or haven't learned. Um, how will school leaders and administrators look back on this year and a half, two years from now, uh, when thinking about changes that need to be made uh, to their institutions? And, uh, uh, and what changes do you, do you think were put in place that will go away? Uh, what were the, were only short term, and, and what's sort of the long term, um, and a long term approach uh, coming out of all of this, and maybe even a new way of thinking about learning. Yeah, it's a it's a fine question, Norm. I, I think um, one of the things that we are going to uh, learn, and and we meaning uh, sort of education leaders, is uh, that uh, we need to be very mindful and listen very carefully to our students. And it was one of the things that I, that I wrote in that piece and one of the things that I was saying a year ago uh, when we were trying to imagine what fall 20 uh, was, was going to look like. And uh, what I said then is I think, I think one of the assumptions that we made very early on in the pandemic and as we shifted everything to Zoom and uh, uh, everything into, into online or remote learning was, you know, we'd been talking about this for a decade or more, that it's inevitable that higher education is going to move online. It's disrupted every other industry, and this is just uh, higher education's turn. And while I think that might certainly be an outcome, I mean, we might, uh, we might in fact come out of this saying, you know, this was the push that we needed to get all the laggards uh, moving into an on online environment. I think we also need to listen very carefully to students and it's not just simply the access questions that, that Krista and I have been talking about. It's a, it's a question of preference, too. There certainly are a number of students that, that want, desire, prefer uh, an online experience. Uh, but, uh, and, and maybe Ohio State is, uh, is, is an exceptional case, although I don't think it is. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been hearing something quite different from our students. And in fact, um, there might even be some, uh, some larger data to support this. Uh, they, might, they might take an online class because it's convenient, 
uh, but their preference is for face to face. And we were hearing that very clearly, I think, by the time we got to spring 21. Uh, we, we've talked about sort of a general Zoom fatigue among all sort of professionals. Students, I think, were feeling it very acutely, uh, although maybe very differently than, uh, than, uh, than other professionals might. And uh, I, I've, I've sort of boiled it down to one student in particular in one of my classes in the spring, who I think was speaking for a number of students who said, you know, uh, after a year of this, I don't feel like I attend the Ohio State University. In looking at a Zoom screen, I don't, I don't feel that this is that I go to Ohio State. And I think that that's something that we need to come to grips with. On the one hand, students are going to say, look, you know, I'm, uh, I, I, this isn't what I signed up for. And there's some evidence to suggest that that was, uh, that was some of the response that we saw from, from students in the fall, certainly in the spring. You know, I just won't attend if this is what it's going to be like. This isn't what I signed up for. And their parents are saying, this is not what we're uh, paying high tuitions for. And so that's, that, that's one set of issues as well. And I think that what's also going to come out of this and, and, and it's, been, it's been sort of loosely articulated by students and by professionals, is that, that there's value in the face-to-face -face experience. In other words, um, the, um, to, you know, to use a, a fancy word, the phenomenology of a face-to-face -face class matters more than we realize. And for some students, that's going to mean you know, uh, they couldn't go to football games or they missed the sorority party or something like that. But I think we're also going to learn uh, that what students were really missing were relationships. And I think that one of the things that's going to come out of this experience is that relationships matter to students. And in fact, maybe that is the real value uh, of higher education. One of the things that's defined online and, and I understand I'm broadly generalizing here, is that it's sort of an exchange of information. We talk about content delivery as being part of online. Uh, education, as everyone on this call knows, education is more than just content delivery. Uh, and it's in many cases, and students again have started articulating this, it's the relationship that they form with a, uh, with a, a, a knowledgeable professor. And until and unless we can replicate something like that in an online experience, I think that students are gonna be voting with their feet that, uh, that they'll by and large demand on face-to-face uh, -face rather than online. Can I ask on both of you, the students you're talking about, what are their ages? What are their ages? ages. So we talking about undergraduates primarily? Or, or in your case, uh, Dr. Wilcox, um, K to 12? Well, I don't teach directly in K-12. I work with school yeah, leaders right, and right. teachers in K-12. Um, so, yeah, so I have some of that um, on the research side. And then um, on my teaching, I'm in uh, master's and doctoral level. So I, I don't have any undergrads. Interesting. Okay. Because the reason I ask is because uh, one of the things that, that I've seen, and it's a, really a question for you, is, is, there a, is there a change as people get older? Because you'll hear... Uh, on the extreme of, of certainly in the K to 12 world, the, the emotional support, the classroom experience is important, even for undergraduates. Um, uh, I've noticed at the graduate level, not quite as important and, and they can find ways of, of, of achieving the goals that you're talking about, the interaction, the friendship and whatever, uh, not just sort of having their heads open and dumping learning into it. Uh, and then um, I'm sure you've all heard of people who said they took COVID as an opportunity to learn a new language or learn a new skill that they're doing online, that they're not actually doing in a classroom experience. And so I wonder whether or not, as people get older, whether or not they, the real impact of, of what we've experienced is actually a, a greater understanding of older people about how they can, uh, can become lifelong learners. I just throw that out to you. I don't know what your own observations are. I, I, David, if you don't mind me going, I'm just thinking about um, one of the courses I taught this last spring. Um, my my uh, students were anywhere between about 24 years old and maybe 40. And uh, I really, you know, it was interesting because it wasn't so much about uh, what age they were in terms of how they were responding to a completely uh, remote or distance learning situation. Um, 
but you know, people have different personalities and some people uh, really rely upon those, um, you know, those connections, those kinds of more personal and, you know, they, they, they need a, um, and they need and want that, that connection in order to uh, learn and feel safe in a classroom where they can ask questions and they can um, really pursue those those things that they want to talk talk about. And one of my colleagues and I were just discussing that you know we really miss those times like before class would start when we were in person. Those were moments where people would kind of check in and you would have those you know those side conversations about something that was important. Um, or I, students would follow me out to my car to just you know follow up on a question or something they wanted to talk more about. And and those those moments are important moments and and they don't happen. Um, as well, I mean, I've I've created a whole bunch of workarounds. Like I'm using Calendly links and things so that people can easily sign up for a time to meet with me by Zoom. But 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 none of that really replaces those walks to the car or, or those you know we we go and get a coffee together or something like that. And uh, I love those examples, Kristen, because I think uh, I, I think that some people might have uh, might have said before. Uh, that, well, that's not really uh, uh, part of the educational experience. So that's you know that that that's this this epiphenomenon. And I think one of the things we're learning is that that is part of the learning, maybe even a critical part of the learning. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, you know, so, uh, Nor so I, I just maybe a quick thought, Norm, to what you're saying about age. Yeah. Uh, I th I think that one of the things that is going to uh, stay in place, at least in my in my professional academic life, are things like conferences like this. Uh, I think that, that the format that we're engaged in here is probably going to become the standard and the idea of traveling someplace, you know, that we all go to some, you know, exotic location to have uh, these uh, uh, academic conferences. That might be uh, a victim of, of the pandemic. Interesting. So have we reached, uh, has COVID uh, reached us, uh, brought us to a maximum in terms of remote learning, or is there still more to go? Is there still, uh, what have we learned in order to be able to improve remote learning as opposed to just saying, okay, we did that, we had to do it, let's go back to the way things were? That's a question for both of you. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to hear from Kristen. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think there's a whole lot uh, more to be done here, and, and I was just thinking about uh, kind of my my major points right now is that we've we've got a lot of work to do on infrastructure and in and if three at least three ways um, the technological infrastructure piece of the puzzle we've talked about a little bit already, um, so just just that you know hardwiring um, and and you know the the skills and using the technologies that are available like Google Classroom was brand new for P12 educators. Um, and you know they they were trying to figure out how to how to fit what their knowledge was about their pedagogy and their content into this this you know kind of container, um, and and it was really limiting. Um, so I think those people who are working on some of the software um, are going to have to continue to expand and learn from what was working well and what wasn't. Um, we also know that. Um, uh, children with special needs and children from different language backgrounds, for example, need a number of different kinds of um, uh, modifications in order to have, um, you know, content accessible to them. So that whole technological infrastructure that takes into account special needs, um, accessibility uh, for learners from different language backgrounds and with different needs, that all has to be continually worked on. Um, the second thing is just the knowledge infrastructure. Um, I, I think that a lot of us are still working on um, something that one of our doctoral students uh, did a dissertation on, which was on the uh, something called TPAC. It's technological um, pedagogical content knowledge. That's a different animal than just having content pedagogical knowledge. In other words, knowing how to teach physics, um, knowing how to teach physics using Blackboard or Google Classroom is, a, is an entirely different animal. So I think there's a lot of work to do there. And then we just have a lot of work to do in improvement infrastructure. Um, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching has done a lot of work on the forefront of creating network improvement communities. But what I found is in our state anyway, um, you know, many of the principals and school leaders and educators really felt pretty isolated. Um, they were making it up as they went along. 
they were not um, being able to work together through some kind of hub organization to learn together. Um, and we need to try to continue to, to uh, build uh, network improvement communities so we can accelerate our learning you know, faster. What, what I'd like to add to that maybe combine some of what uh, Jay and Val have just uh, shared in the, uh, in the chat. One of the, the biggest lessons, or maybe just because I was uh, particularly uh, attuned to this, uh, one of the biggest lessons I've learned during the COVID year is that I did more mentoring, maybe even that I did teaching. And by mentoring, I mean sort of one-on-one -on -one with students. I mean, we're still over Zoom, we're still doing this remotely. And, and this is maybe my own bias. I have long said that the best kind of teaching is one-on-one. -on -one. And as you add more and more students to that, I think the efficacy of the experience is lessened in each case. And so I did a lot more one-on-one -on -one teaching, tutoring, mentoring. And uh, I, frankly, I would like to see maybe that become the model for how we think about or design online learning. Uh, that, that maybe the best sort of online experience is one where I can work directly with an individual student uh, rather than uh, I think what we've attempted to do, which is to say, you know, let's take, you know, a 300 uh, uh, student lecture class and try to uh, deliver that uh, remotely. I think that that's probably a recipe for failure, uh, but rethinking the nature of teaching, and it would be a, a major undertaking, I understand that. But maybe one of our uh, big lessons from the COVID year is that we can uh, uh, encourage more mentorship. Yeah, it's been my own experience as well during this COVID mm -hmm. year and, and uh, a lot more time I was able to spend with students. So it's, yes. Uh, um, we unfortunately are at the end of our time. I think that we have responded at least indirectly to most of the comments. Um, and uh, feel free, though, to contact uh, uh, these uh, these folks. These are the people that are helping the world think about where the future is going for learning. So um, contact them. And uh, obviously, uh, I think you've heard in a variety of ways that what ICF has been talking about for years is critically important. And uh, we'll see see more of it, not just in response to a pandemic, but as the world changes and hopefully more people get broadband. With that, thank you very much, uh, David and Kristen. Uh, wonderful observations, really insightful. Thank you, everybody, thank you. for attending. <laughs>